I'm going to talk about uh, communication skills during collaborative problem solving, which is relatively well defined. Uh, and the, here's the argument. Uh, we have lots of evidence that these are important skills. Uh, and primarily the way we're measuring them today is with rating scales. So I do want to say something about the limitations of rating scales as measures of communication skills. And uh, then I'm going to present two examples, PISA 2015 measured collaborative problem solving and on the computer. And then we have a, uh, we, we're, we're, we're doing a couple experiments now with a, a platform. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that and some prospects for where that takes us. So the, the idea of communication skills, there's some work done that shows that uh, communication skills are, um, are, are increasingly uh, um, uh, uh, jobs that require communication skills are growing, and returns to communication skills have gone up since 2000, whereas returns to cognitive skills and jobs uh, has remained relatively flat, went up in the 80s and 90s, flat after 2000. Uh, we did a simple correlation. We took, uh, there's an office of um, the, uh, what is it called, the Occupational Network, uh, ONET, Department of Labor. Uh, they collect about 200 or 300 ratings on jobs every year. And we did a factor analysis to reduce that to about 10 dimensions. And we find that one of the dimensions, communication dimension, uh, the correlations with earnings is about 0.58. Uh, another dimension, by the way, uh, th that's at the job level, uh, which is about the same as the correlation with general cognitive ability, which is well known to be a driver of earnings in jobs. So that's a kind of an interesting finding. Uh, the teamwork, interestingly, was much lower. So jobs that require teamwork don't pay much more than jobs that require um, uh, lots of teamwork. Not, no teamwork, it's not a discriminator. Uh, but communication. So this is a little bit different from um, Deming attributes this to teamwork. It's not really, or social skills. It's not really social skills per se, but it's more of a um, communication skills. And then on surveys, surveys of employers, communication skills, oral and written, always rise to the top in terms of what employers say they're looking for. We're doing an analysis now on what's actually appearing in job ads to verify that what employers say on these surveys is backed up with what they're actually looking for. But I wish I had some results to show on that, but we don't have that, uh, that study's not finished yet. Okay, so... Um, so, what, so we measure these with rating skills. What's wrong, what's wrong with rating scales? One wrong thing wrong is that it's hard to interpret um, the findings from rating scales as indicating anything like growth. So we did a study with um, 11,000, 14,000 kids, grades 6th, 7th, and 8th. And um, so here's the change. This is on a teamwork scale that had 25 questions. There are four categories. The categories are never, sometimes, often, always, those kinds of categories. Uh, and then we just add up the, the number of, uh, we put those into four, add up the number. So 25 items, that means the minimum score is 25, goes up to 100. Uh, and there, I am a good team member. I work effectively with others. I can lead others effectively. I respect my friends' opinions. The typical type of rating scales. Now let's take a look at grade six, 74.7. Grade seven, uh, 74.7. Uh, grade eight, 75.1. So it's not really showing much change. You might expect that the skill might go up or it might go down or something, but it's certainly not acting like a cognitive skill, which on average goes up about a third um, of a standard deviation every year. Yeah. I have a question regarding the exact framing. Is this often these questions are um, how does the student behave compared to others? That's or a teacher. That's a teacher questions. So the teacher had six questions, and 
uh, for the roster of students is asked, is a good team member, works effectively with others, leads other, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the numbers for that, 18.3, 18.6, 18.6. So my, my question yeah. was in the direction, so people compare themselves to others, or teachers compare yeah. one student to other students. And right. Yeah, so there, there's a the, yeah, reference group effect. So that this is, right, it's well documented. Um, but I, I'm just trying to illustrate concretely what the problem is. If we want to interpret this as a growth or some indicator of skill, it might be, but it has this problem of the reference group and a number of other problems that we can identify. Yeah, Brandon? But you've chosen the quietest part of the life course. There's abundant evidence from other ages that people grow using rating scales. I'm not, I'm not, I agree right. with your point that rating scales are not ideal, but right. I don't see any reason to take this data seriously in terms of let's say, saying rating scales are right. bad protection. Right, absolutely. I mean, this, this is the worst part of the life course to get anything because these kids yeah, do not could do be. any growing on any dimension that we find. <laughs> if, if, if anything, it's worse than most things. Um, because they're, they're, they're learning to roll their eyes at this point and be, you know, Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I don't understand the assumption that there should be growth. There's no assumption. I'm just showing numbers. And this is this is results from a survey. Would this so, be true for people like participating in certain kinds of clubs or certain, I don't know, for example, or athletes? Right. So we have a lot I'm of. I'm just curious. So yeah, this, yeah. In this growth here. Um, I, I mean, so so the question is, do we want to look at that? Do we want to even investigate that as an outcome? In other words, do we want to look at covariates? that might relate to this. So I'm just conditioning. I mean, this kind of team or, is okay, not something yeah. that maybe sixth graders are much doing. But if they're on a sports team or right. somehow, yeah. you know, they're all running, for example, on, uh, on some kind of relay team, right. that would be, I would bet they would go up. With right. Age. But I, that's why I'm just wondering what, what the background is of these kids being assessed at that point. But, yeah, these are, uh, this is, these are the elites. They're at uh, independent schools. So the, LA Unified School District is different. They are not the elites. But this is making the same point. This is the uh, California Office for Form Education um, conducted a survey, operational survey, to look at growth and non-cognitive skills. So it's very serious. So Brent, you might be right, but the fact is that people are taking these responses seriously. Right? No argument there. I'm just saying that just as a life course person, it's just like, okay, I'm, if I'm going to pick the worst possible. But, they, but there's a great need. People really want to understand this. So that's why California Unified, in fact, uh, nine districts in California have invested time and energy to actually administer this survey to up to a million kids because there's a need. And so you might say, well, nothing's happened in sixth and eighth grade. But, you know, the policymakers want to know what's going on in sixth and eighth grade. And I'm saying that the, the, um, the, the, the liquid surveys aren't really providing the information policymakers need. That's the point. And if you look at, if you, if you well, no, well, okay, so here's the point. Um, these are three different cohorts. These are elementary students in 2014, 2015, 2016. Cohort differences, as you can see, if you just, and then this is elementary and middle and high school. You know, I, the cohort differences are as, as big as the, uh, growth differences, which I don't know what that tells you, but it means that it's hard to interpret what's going on with the rating scales. That, that's the point. And these are, uh, you know, this is the um, growth mindset questions, and they had a number of questions in this survey. So I, I don't, I don't want to make too, a bit, this is not the point of the talk, it's just that this is the problem that we're trying to deal with, is the limitations of um, Another one is lack of comparability. So this is uh, data from PISA 2003, actually. Um, math self-concept, uh, comparing, uh, let's see, comparing Mexico and Hong Kong. Uh, percent agree, either strongly or agree. So Hong Kong's um, PISA score, uh, achievement scores are about a standard deviation higher than Mexico's. So you might expect their attitudes to be higher um, I'm just not good at mathematics. Uh, m the Hong Kong st students, 57, agree that they're not good at mathematics. 48% um, of the Mexican students agree that they're not good at mathematics. In other words, it's a flip over what the achievement data say. It could be a reference issue. It's an unknown, right? 
that's an unknown, whether it's, um, I get good grades in mathematics. So all these questions go in reverse order from what you'd expect. So can we make much? I'm not sure that's true. What, what's? Why would you think that in Hong Kong you have different, the way their parents are raising them and what their, their expectations right, yeah. are? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah, so what we do. Um, goes to a higher standard. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Right. So th there are these discussions, many discussions along these lines. And so what we can show actually is that with um, alternative versions of these, such as using a forced choice methodology, we get rid of all this. And that's an important talk, but it's not the one I'm going to talk about today because the focus is on games. But, that, but I'm saying that... The, we can make that available. You should game a version of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's see. Collaborative problem solving. So in PISA 2015, there was a collaborative problem solving um, assessment given. Uh, developed at ETS. And it basically, the framework is, this is a classic problem-solving framework that goes back to Polya um, in the 1950s. And it's been used by a number of people since then, John Bransford and others. So that's pretty standard. Across are the collaborative aspects. Establish communication, a shared understanding, take an appropriate action, and establishing a team organization. So this, this framework, uh, this problem-solving step by collaboration um, type of interaction created a set of uh, kind of tasks and a subset of these were actually administered, focused on these, were administered in PISA 2015. Is this Polly the mathematician? Yeah. Same guy. Yeah, same guy. How to solve problem, how, how to solve it, I think how that was, it. yeah, okay. right. So that's where PISA 2015 problem solving came from. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Well, not the communication part, he didn't have that, he was, you know. But um, so this is the this is a, a, a screenshot from PISA 2015 collaborative problem solving, and what you can see is like the um, three C task that Michelle showed. It has a multiple choice interface, so at any point you can select an option, and um, you're actually interacting. There was a lot of discussion about how to do this in PISA. Uh, it ended up being that you're interacting with an agent and rather than uh, with another human. So it's a simulated collaboration. Um, nevertheless, some, um, Samuel Greif is doing a human-human versus um, human-agent comparison study that hasn't been published yet, I don't think. Anyway, um, so it has this kind of game back. You, you have a task, and then you're supposed to divide up the labor and interact with each other and so forth. And so that's... Um, Pieces on a schedule, and so the first thing that was published is just the final outcomes. But there's a lot of interest in the process analysis along the lines of what Michelle is doing. But I just want to focus on the, the uh, findings because they're quite, I think, quite interesting from the standpoint of measuring um, communication. Uh, first of all, math, reading, and science in PISA. PISA, by the way, I don't know how many people know. It's a survey given to 15-year-olds um, based on national... Um, probability samples in about 80 countries, and um, and uh, uh, it's translated. In, it's in 60 languages or so, and uh, and it's math, reading, science, and some fourth thing. And in the 2015 cycle, it was collaborative problem solving. 2012 was it's given every three years. 2012 was problem solving. So uh, CPS with collaborative problem solving is highly correlated. Just they're all highly correlated with each other, extremely highly correlated, highly correlated uh, typically above 0.8. Um, however, there is some differentiation, and this is where it's interesting. The, uh, so you can, exp you can produce an expected CPS score for a country based on their math, reading, and science, but the ones that uh, did where their collaborative problem solving was better than expected are, and the 23, this is on a scale of 100, so this is a standard, uh, an effect size of about 0.23, standard deviation of 100. So Japan was 23 points. This is the, pay, the scale on PISA is 500 with 100 standard deviation. Japan was 23 points higher than expected based on math, reading, and science. 
Uh, Australia also, US interestingly also, New Zealand, Korea, Singapore, all, all very strong economies. I, <laughs> you can see that here. Uh, CPS worse than expected, Russia minus 22, Turkey minus 18, Montenegro, Tunisia, China. Interestingly, China lower than expected, Singapore, which is largely Chinese, and Hong Kong, Chinese culture, uh, better than expected. So it's kind of an interesting. Um, here's the, maybe one of the mo more interesting findings is that in problem solving, that was a 2012 piece of boys outperform girls in, er in almost every country. Uh, but in collaborative problem solving, girls outperform boys uh, in every country. And that's despite the fact that these problem solving, collaborative problem solving are extremely highly related. Uh, this is a, and so uh, this is a very interesting, now uh, Anita Woolley did this study on, um, on kind of a collaborative uh, task. And Anita Woolley and a bunch of MIT folks, they use social metric badges to look at things like turn taking and so forth. And one of the things that um, she found was that uh, one of the best predictors of the effectiveness of a group was the percentage of females in that group. So more females, better performance in collaboration. It's consistent with the PISA finding, which is done with the half a million kids, so. Okay, um, now going back to the rating scale issue. So here, uh, we can look at these high CPS countries and low CPS countries. Uh, and there's several teamwork issues. I'm, I'm a good listener. I enjoy seeing my class classmates being successful. I, work, I prefer working as part of a team. I enjoy cooperating with peers. Um, and there's essentially no correlation between the responses on these Likert items and performance in the collaborative problem solving task. Uh, and the good countries don't do any different from the bad countries. I mean, that's the point here. There's some, some of these items, good countries do better. Uh, but So a performance measure, I mean, this is actually kind of motivating the conference. A performance measure tells you something very different from a rating scale measure for these kinds of soft skills type constructs. That's the point here. Uh, the ep, uh, the um, now these would be self-reports. Okay, so this is a self-report. Right. Would it be something where uh, you would have a teacher assessing it? A teacher report. Um, PISA, or PISA or doesn't somebody have Somebody else external to the person. No, yeah, PISA doesn't have that. NAEP has that. So NAEP is National Assessment of Educational Progress. NAEP does have, um, actually there is parent reports. Um, I'm sorry, in PISA. Um, I'm just curious how well it would correspond. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting. I, I don't know if anyone's looking at that, uh, if there's anything that could be matched up. Because generally speaking, at. a lot of these studies, right. the, the, the view is self-reports are really right. bad. And uh, teaching yeah. reports are supposedly the gold standard. Here. Right. Well, you yeah, have the problem with PISA is that there's so, such huge cultural differences in how people use the response scale. That comparability is a huge, I mean, that's the Hong Kong, Mexico example. Comparability is a big problem. Um, but within the US, maybe something like NAEP, which is planning on doing something like PISA uh, as a task mm -hmm. to roll out, uh, that could be done. That, that, that'd be, uh, in, yeah. Uh, so, no, Tons of evidence with the scales are highly correlated with tasks, even in right. standardized tasks. And if I read these questions, I haven't really understood what the CPS test is really all about. But this is more, more or less asking about preferences for engaging collaborative activities. Right. It's very different to being good at it. I mean, like, yeah. I would have expected a positive correlation anyway, so I sort of that's another way to, and I see the, you know, mm -hmm. I see the general issue, I see that. But right. For that particular example, I mean, you know, yeah. suppose I would ask many questions, self-reported questions, on the things that are, you know, very close to the CBS task. Uh, yeah, I, I can tell you, yeah. yeah. Right? So it seems right. these are actually, so, you know, 
yeah. pointing at different issues. Do I want to engage? Do I enjoy what I'm doing? Right. Yeah. So in PISA, yeah. But I hate it. Right. No, in PISA, they, there are a set of questions called, PISA, in PISA terminology, it's called self-efficacy. And those are typically the highest correlates of performance. I mean, and the best kind of self-efficacy is a giving a task sample and making a confidence judgment on whether you could do this. It becomes very close to your performance on the task. So you're right about that. Whereas the generalized, the more generalized in PISA terminology is called self-esteem, like mathematics self-esteem or... Uh, those are so dependent on cross-cultural differences and use of the response scale that they're hard to compare cross-culturally. You get into the Hong Kong, Mexico problem. So, but within a country, yeah, they're, they're, they work pretty well. They, they, they do okay, the self-esteem, not as well as the self-efficacy. Is this within the country or what about different groups within the same country? Right, I mean, so that's... Uh, you know, minorities and... Uh, well, I mean, there's the... Uh, there, you mentioned men and women, but right. uh, just... I think there's this life. kind of... There, there's a nicely documented effect. It's, um, there was a, st a study someone wrote. I um, can't remember. But it was called the uh, Attitude Achievement Paradox in African American Males. And it was the exact same thing. So higher confidence judgments and, you know, map to lower performance and th this kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so it's within... Right. I just wanted to back you up in this case that it's almost a rule in psychology that if you have a performance measure and a self-report measure and an observation that they're all going to be relatively uncorrelated with each other, all three will predict the outcome independent of one another. Just that, that's like, you find that over Good point, and over yeah. and over again. It doesn't matter what domain. The key question then which follows, which this group has to deal with is which one is measuring what you're interested in. Um, it might be they're all measuring something you're interested in, but they all might right. also be measuring something different. So, right. But that's, yeah. that's really common in psychology. Um, Thank you for just uh, mentioning that. I, in, in, the, in the performance measurement world in large organizations, there's a, a revolution right now in performance appraisal going on where people are, are killing ratings. They're getting rid of them because of rater bias and self-assessment. They're just not uh, aligning. So um, I just know in a practical sense, there's a lot of pushback against that right now. Right. And there's, I mean, there's workarounds to that. I mean, the forced choice methodology is actually very effective, and we have good meta-analytic data that shows forced choice versions of Likert scale type questions provides much better prediction of uh, working um, uh, work performance. Yeah, judged by typically supervisor ratings, um, but earnings also. So, um, anyway, the, so the. the the experiment here was with the, this, this game environment and uh, where people are learning a, a, a lesson about volcanoes. And then there's, over here, you can see this chat box. And so they're allowed to, now this is, a, this is an open-ended chat. Unlike what Michelle is talking about, unlike PISA 2015, you can say whatever you want. And so the task here is then to try to classify what it is people say. So in this, the, this experiment, what happened was that uh, peop, there was a group of people, 500 people or whatever, uh, who did a, the task alone. There was a certain performance level, how many problems they got correct. And then there is a, um, a group, uh, another 500 uh, dyads who worked together. But when they worked together, they did it. They actually solved the problem three times. First, alone. So this is the same. But there's twice as many people. That's why that shrinks. And then, um, then they solved it once after chatting. And so performance goes up here after they have a ch chance to talk. And then they performed a third time when the machine randomly selected one of the participants to em enter the correct answer. So it gets better. And then um, the actual... What, would they, what they chatted about was classified by this kind of taxonomy of chat type characterizations. 33, uh, student uses relevant evidence to point out some gap in the teammate statement. For example, that would be a classification. Uh, student expresses progress in understanding, that, you know, that, that sort of thing. And then those, are, those come together as uh, for sharing ideas, negotiating, regulating, and maintaining communication. So for example, hello, that's an example of maintaining 
communication, hi, hey. These are, these are actual things that people wrote in the chat box. So yes, same here. Uh, D sound right to you. So these, we classify um, first uh, human classification and then uh, we do uh, machine learning to do machine classification. And actually the machine classification is pretty good. It's about close to the human classification, which is how we do our, we do machine scoring of essays and the machine scoring of essays is actually better than human, but they're pretty close. Anyway, uh, so what the finding here is that um, there are a couple places where the effective collaboration group um, did more of this than the ineffective group. So mainly in this kind of sequence of share and then negotiate, and then, um, and then another one here of negotiate and share. So those are two instances with where um, the good groups will do that. We'll do more of that than the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. I have a quick question. So if you put in the, I mean, the students in the groups, and then like, what kind of questions do you ask the people the game? Say like to achieve some target or not? Like, do they know anything like about this game? Yeah, we, the, the teacher, um, um, one potential thing is maybe some smart kids can like solve them by, by, by themselves. Like they don't need to like uh, communicate with others and everyone right. finds the results. Right, yeah. So this is just, the graph I just showed you is averaging over, yeah, there are people who, they give a science pretest. So we know when they come in whether they, how much they know already. Uh, and of course, uh, Let's see, I think I, another, um, there is, um, so prior science knowledge is correlated with the scores and that pairing high and low knowledge, uh, high and no, low knowledge dyad are the ones who show the largest pre-post changes. Um, so, yeah. Uh, this is the comparison of machine and human, 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 human machine classification. What else? Um, a lot of variability in the, um, uh, in the, in the, in the teams. Um, so uh, the other thing is that we can now do this real time, um, classification of what they say in the chat window which is kind of nice, at least to the level of these four categories, because that means you can facilitate the interaction, which I, you guys probably do this and I, I don't know, right? This sort of understand, or you do um, linguistic analysis of the, no, we do. oh, you don't do that, okay. All right. So um, anyway, we, I mean, we, uh, this, it's nice that you can do, um, linguistic analysis in real time with some degree of accuracy because it allows you to run experiments. I mean, you can manipulate this stuff and also to, to provide supervision and facilitation. Yeah. Uh, what, oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Someone back there. Okay. Um, so you, you motivated this by the, by the Deming paper, for example. Um, is well, I wouldn't say. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but I, it's a nice most, thing to show that communication is important. Mo most of the discussion on the first slide was there was somehow a measure of communication or, or social skills, and and these kind of work show that people that score higher on this communication or social measure are better in a certain task. Will there be also be at some point of the project that you come up with a one measurement of of communication or social skills? Yeah, I mean, so the process analysis is starting to su suggest what patterns are associated with success, are correlated with success. And so that begins to motivate a kind of a picture of what effective communication skills are. So, I mean, you might a priori have a theory that says negotiation is a good effective communication skill, but, um, but we're doing data-driven to 
see whether the degree to which that's supported in real interactions between so people. So potential finding, because you have it on the slide, would be that agreeableness is maybe a good proxy because it predicts. What would be? Agreeableness might be a good proxy because it predicts uh, success. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, however, this, yeah, I mean, that, that could be. That we're having a, um, I don't know why this, this is, this is one of these funny findings. Two people who are disagreeable, um, they tend to show the, for the, whatever reason, the lowest, uh, I mean, the highest uh, pre-post changes. I mean, I, you know, we have to replicate this finding. I mean, it's a nice sample and so forth, but, uh, you know, I, this is kind of a weird thing. I, so it's partly, I mean, it's largely data-driven. What's not data-driven is the classification. We're not wedded to this class, classification. There could be another classification. If you know of another classification scheme, we could. They don't agree, but they, they agree to disagree. And, uh, and then they go forward and go accomplish forward. something. You know. So, so can I ask something? You asked me if we had something to analyze yeah. language. Yeah. The, I mean, we haven't built a model to do that. But certainly, instead of testing that with a certain exam, if you wanted to take whatever uh, uh, machine learning you have, you can certainly apply that to all of the blog posts and written material that we actually collect on a kid and start oh. to use that to really determine what they're really doing every day to start to answer some of the, qu the, right. the traits you're trying to have. So the beauty of, of at yeah. least Otis is that you're you're collecting multiple data points all the time and not right. just on a test right. that presumably with the right analytics you can see where they are in some level. Right, and I mean, if, if, and as you get more and more and more and more and more and more data, I mean, you can make it purely data driven and just put all kinds of things together that, and then later take a look at why that might be the case. Someone said, Interpretive AI or whatever this phrase. This is coming full circle. Machine learning used to come out of psychology in the back in the 80s, and then I drifted away, and it became pure statistics in 2000. So I was happy to see that now it's coming. Now it's back to interpretive. Yeah, it's very interesting. So, but anyway, the point is that so we're doing partly data driven, but we start with the classification because we we have human classification, and then we machine learning. We do uh, supervised learning to figure out that based on the human classification. So we do have to start with that human classification. We don't have enough data to do purely unsupervised something that, that you could do with, gra with grades at the end of it or something. I don't know. Could you imagine yeah. this as a way of forming study groups or parent Yeah, I mean, I, here, here's, here's, this would be an ideal thing. So this thing is very easy to use. We do it. We can do it in classrooms. We can do it on um, Amazon Mechanical Turk, I mean, anywhere. Uh, it's just lacking data. So we've done it with, you know, 1,000, 1,500 people. But we need to do it on 20,000 people or, you know, or 50,000 people. And then we can find out things like, you know, what are these optimal study groups? What, what, what are the prospects for a study group? What is the effect of who you're paired with on your on your, uh, on, your, on your observed performance with respect to the skill. So, I mean, that's an unknown. With some yeah. of these other traits that are elicited and yeah. have been put in the log on that right. you know, previous uh, runs, for example. Right. Some other elicitations of personality. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's I mean, we, we collected a little bit here, but not optimal. Not, so not. you could imagine sort of constructing groups optimally. Right. And maybe recursively. Right. Well, I mean, for example, the, the knowledge thing, I think there is some um, evidence in the education literature that uh, pairing low and not high knowledge people is a good thing. Um, reciprocal teaching. There's a, this work back in the 1980s that showed that if you have, it's good for the low performing student because he can identify with another student better than with the distant teacher. It's good for, for the high performing teacher because you never learn something as well as you do when you teach it, you right? Teach it. Yeah. But so these that about yeah. older children versus younger children, even in the family. Right. Yeah. Of that. yeah. So right. By age. Yeah. 